The South Georgia Peanuts coaching staff had just pulled the team off the field during the seventh inning of a game against the Macon Music. In a game marked by multiple ejections and a bench-clearing fight, the forfeit would become the biggest story of the game. So I get a phone call from Phil. It was Phil Plantier who calls me at about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. He goes, Kevin Wally pulled his team off the field. They're forfeiting. The one thing that I've never seen nor heard of in this game, professional baseball, is refusing to finish a ball game. We just felt that it was better just to, you know, pull the team off the field. I had nothing to do with you know, the game, whether we were up or down or anything like that, we just didn't feel that the situation was handled properly. And, uh, you know, we just felt that uh, we just weren't going to be able to feel the team. If we did, it was going to be pitchers out there that were going to be throwing the next day. You know, we just couldn't take the chance of risking injuries there. So there was some, there was some miscommunication with regard to the number of players that were ejected and whether, you know, whether they were going to be able to continue to play with the number they had. None of the players on Macon got thrown out of the game. The hitter went after the guy with the bat. He doesn't get thrown out of the game. We didn't even hit the guy. There was two pitches that were close. One pitch was almost a strike. One pitch went to the backstop, you know, but we never really actually did hit him. And then Arroyo, you know, charges the mound with the bat, and originally he wasn't thrown out of the game. I mean, that's immediate ejection. As soon as you step out of the batter's box and head towards the player with the bat, I mean, you're gone. The weird thing about it was is the umpires um, said that they had broken up the, the fight. Uh, the newspaper account said that they broke up the fight. They were nowhere to be found. They stepped back out of the way and they were sitting there laughing about the whole thing. So for them to say that they, they were in there and trying to break things up and calm things down, they just did the opposite. All the things that happened prior to not returning to the field, uh, to me, that's all part of the game. Under any circumstances, to, to pull your team off the field and, and, and to leave is, is just totally wrong. That, to me, is the only thing that happened last night that is completely unreasonable and and should not be tolerated and it's just not how you play professional baseball. Phil's big deal was that uh, the fans didn't get their money's worth. They got their money's worth. We played seven innings. They beat the out of us 12 to 2. They seen a fight. They seen the ejections. They seen exactly what they wanted to see me getting thrown out of the game. They got their money's worth. As reports of the forfeit reached the national media and wire services, the South Coast League tried to determine how to react. We, we basically discussed what was the most appropriate way to try to, um, to move forward and you know, send the message to uh, anybody that followed our league that, hey, this is a serious situation, we want to handle it, and we don't want this to happen again in the South Coast League. First there was going to be fines, then there was going to be suspensions, then there was going to be fines and suspensions. Uh, I mean, it, it, it was like a ping pong match. It was going back and forth, you know, a couple of different times. They end up throwing out suspensions. They were going to suspend all my coaches for like five days. Uh, and unless I wanted to take an eight game suspension. And I says, I, I, the whole argument was, why do I have to be suspended? He was willing to take that eight game or a nine game suspension, whatever it was, to keep our coaches on the field and keep our players on the field. And that's kind of the guy he is, you know. What Wally did, was, you know, just goes to show that he not only stands up for his players, but he stands up for his coaches too. Backman went home to Oregon to serve his suspension while Olenberger took over as manager. You know, so it was, I don't know if it was publicity, what it might have been, uh, but it ended up being a big deal and that's why I came home to serve an eight game suspension for my coaches. Wally wasn't even in the game, you know, he was in the clubhouse. The, the newspaper reports, all the articles that come out, you know, about 90 and 95 percent of that stuff is false. They got about five percent of it right. Yes, he did go out and argue a call, he did get thrown out of the game, you know, and that's about the whole truth. Anything that's, that's after that, they don't know the underlying facts of exactly what went on or how it went down. Most of the ejections, I'm not just saying us on our team, but probably throughout the league has been based on the poor umpiring situation. The quality of umpiring had been a source of concern for each of the league's managers, but signs of other, more serious problems were beginning to surface. The most glaring problem was that attendance was down across the league. The only team that draws any fans is Macon, you know? We get a fair share of fans. You know, we have good fans that come out and support us. But Bradenton, I mean, it's a first year league and they already had to make a team travel, a travel team. The Bradenton Juice had lost their home field just weeks into the season. In retrospect, this event foreshadowed major problems for the league. We were bleeding red there. Uh, just any, any day we would try to open up and play, it was killing us. And for a startup business, we knew we were gonna take a hit this first year, but the hit we were taking there, um, and the fan base didn't really re seem to respond, but at the same time, I don't think we did a good job there. The amount of time they had to set this league up, I mean, they had months and months and months of planning. 
They first of all, they set it up in two places where we don't even have locker rooms. In Anderson and Aiken, we don't even have locker rooms. We have to sit outside in the 100 degree heat, no locker room, we have to change basically in the bullpens out in front of sight of everybody. Back home in Albany, most of the Peanuts day-to-day -day staff had been laid off, leaving players and coaches as the primary groundskeepers. The league itself had fueled speculation about its own financial problems when it canceled the year-end All-Star game. When we saw, or when we came to the, the realization that, hey, maybe an All-Star game at the end of the year isn't, isn't the greatest idea, we're going to have to have all of this money that physically isn't out there. Basically, we're just going to take $25,000 out of the South Coast League's pocket and say, hey, enjoy your All-Star game, which just didn't really make much sense for us. There came up the thing of, well, let's cancel the All-Star game. And it's like, cancel the All-Star game. That's going to put up red flags for everybody. And that's going to say, hey, these guys are you know, really in trouble here financially. But the biggest red flag was raised by local businesses who claimed that they had not been paid for services provided to the league. Well, I'm Casey Udani, the manager of a sleeping hotel in Aiken, South Carolina. They owe um, quite a bit of money, you know. And the thing is, they are behind on it. They are having some. I heard about some financial troubles that they are having in it. They cancel all-star games. And the money is owed about um, $18,000, $17,000, It's basically a close <laughs> the entire league. I mean, first year, you expect there to be screw-ups and everything, but they're treating it like they don't even want this league to last another year. safe. I went to him. I says, I know. You went this. safe. Yes, I did. I don't know if I got a tag when because he hit him, but I don't know if he had the ball in his hand. Well, his foot's on the bag. Who? This is going to be wonderful. Delightful. Excuse me. Have you ever heard of the South Georgia Peanuts? The what? No chance they've ever heard of us. No chance. Hi. She's like, hey. I think we should go stand in the corner and just wave. Dude, we could do that. This is awesome. I'm glad you invited me to do this. How you doing today? It would be sick if we had our theme song just playing over and over again. South Georgia Peanuts, one shell of a good time. Maybe you should just continue to sing it. Just put myself on repeat. Get you a bell and just put you outside. A cowbell? Yeah. Kind of like Santa Claus at Christmas time. Please come to our games. How are you? Hey. She walked right by. Sweet. South Georgia Peanuts. One shell of a good time. Woo. So what's your name? Cody. Cody? I'm Chris. Nice to meet you, buddy. This is Mike. I'm Mike. How you doing? How old are you? I'm 11. 11? What position do you play? Uh, Everywhere? Short stop, hard fight. The infield. Infield? All over, huh? Do you throw gas? Uh, you throw hard? I'm only good at glass. You throw sliders right now? You're gonna hurt your elbow. He said it just naturally cuts. Oh. Would you like this? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll get you a ball tonight when you come to the game. How's that? All right, buddy. Thank y'all for coming. One loyal fan. From two hours of sitting here. Hey, is that PA on? Yes, it is. Keep the ball out of the air, brother. Line drives. <laughs> Peanuts manager Wally Backman was back from his eight-game suspension. At the top of his lineup card was center fielder Curtis Goodwin, who had been brought in to bolster the lineup after the departures of John Zerang and Steve Garibrands. Goodwin had spent five years in the major leagues with five different teams. The highlight of his career was when he was in the starting lineup the night Cal Ripken broke Lou Gehrig's consecutive games played streak. Hello, my name is Curtis Goodwin. Uh, I'm from Oakland, California. Uh, I'll be 35 next month for those who's watching. You know, Curtis played in the big leagues. He's got four or five years or something like that in the big leagues. He still has the tools. 
speed that it takes to play the game. Uh, you know, he's got above average speed still. He's a character, man. He's a good ball player. I mean, hell of a leadoff batter, but you know, he's just he's just the guy that is going to do what he does, and he's going to tell you about it the whole time. Though it's it's hilarious. He, he cracks me up. Goodwin loved telling stories about his time in the major leagues, and he liked comparing knuckleballer Chris Webb to Tim Wakefield. I used to hate facing Wakefield. I actually didn't mind. It was like playing, I used to play Nerf, Nerf, um, you know, Nerf ball, Wolf ball, yeah. The balls with the hole before I faced him. It was like, it was like really no real big reason to take BP when Wakefield threw because you seen one foul and it looked like gay ass. Come on now, children. You have got to be kidding me. I ain't got no toy. Super baby, baby. Get the foul pole. That a baby. Come on, come on, Curtis. Right there on two. There's some good players here. I mean, I like this team here. Some good players here. The league is is uh, very bushy. Um, nothing really <laughs> goes on as that you expect. I don't think they got an opportunity at the Little League World Series. I'm probably let alone in this place right here. Uh, baby. Oh. Good oh, They're not the best of umpires I've had before. <laughs> That's not straight. It can get the most of you, and it can affect, you know, if you if you let it, uh, it can affect your game. Oh, wow. this. Look through the bars, not at them. Let's go. It's not that they're not trying. I'm sure the umpires are trying, but. Those off the plate? They haven't been prepared, I think, at this level, at a professional level. George, what? you gotta what? me! Come on, George! With all the managers complaining, it sort of let us know, hey, it's, it's, if it's bad, it's equally bad across the league, and you know, there's equal complaints coming, so at some point, you know, it's, uh, it, it works out in the best interest of the league. Well, these guys are out here working hard, doing their best. Sometimes they're not very consistent, which is what would kind of make them a bad umpire. Keep playing. Go. What the f is going on? How can you call him out after that? I didn't call him out. He called him out. George called him out. He called him safe. He asked me, did he have the ball in front of him? I said yes. So he called him out. He, he, he didn't call it. Jason didn't call it. George did. You called him safe, George. He's safe. I said, I don't know if I got a tag. I went to him. I says, I know. You went yes, safe. Yes, I did. But then he asked me to make a ruling. So I went to him. I said, I don't know if I got a tag when because he hit him. But I don't know if he had the ball in his hand. Well, his foot's on the bag. Who? The runner. They hit together the runner. The, the well, a tie goes to the runner then, right? No, no. He was in front of the runner. Well, you can't call a guy safe and then call him out. Two South Georgia Peanuts have been suspended for 10 games for violating the league's drug policy. I will fight for my players, especially when I know I'm right. Breaking news out of the South Coast League tonight. The league announced today that two South Georgia Peanuts have been suspended for 10 games for violating the league's drug policy. Right fielder Doc Brooks and second baseman Joey Hooft will be out of the lineup until August 16th after random test samples came up positive for a masking agent. Both Brooks and Hooft tested negative for steroids, but their tests revealed diluted samples. However, manager Wally Backman says that's because both Brooks and Hooft were taking niacin, an over-the-counter B vitamin, which is approved by Major League and Minor League Baseball. And Backman says this seems just like another example of the league targeting his club. I don't know if a witch hunt is the right word, but we've had some problems here, and uh, uh, we always seem to be the ones that, that, that have the, uh, the biggest things come about. Our goal is to be the premier independent professional league in the country, so how do we get there? Being a first-year league, we knew that we'd have to, to, to do some things that would differentiate what we're trying to accomplish 
and set us apart. You don't throw my players under a bus or out in front of a bus. I don't care who you are, where you are, I will fight for my players, especially when I know I'm right. The, the drug issue is important to us. That's one that, uh, you know, like I said, it's a hot button in our industry today. Uh, no other independent league that I know of chooses to have a policy. It's weird because, you know, they're promoting that they busted somebody. They have this, you know, they're kind of glorifying it with, with the graphics on the internet. I, I just kind of thought that was, you know, a little, you know, maybe some hilarity added to it. I don't know. Backman's first contention was that the test revealed the presence of niacin, which was not a banned substance. Uh, there was some talk of, um, I forget the name of the drug, but some sort of uh, med medical um, prescription drug that they had been taking or, or some issue like that. And uh, I forget the name of this drug. It, it, niacin. Yeah. It was niacin. Niacin's in everything you take, like multivitamins or anything. Niacin's in there. You know, I was taking uh, over-the-counter uh, you know, one of those body cleansing things that you get at GNC and when I was told the, you know, the thing that showed up as a masking agent was the niacin, which, you know, was in that. They had a legitimate beef about the way that the league conducted its drug testing policy. When uh, professional baseball players in the major and minor leagues are tested, that, you know, they are given a form to, to what kind of medications or any kind of, and that way the, the screener knows what he's looking for. This did not happen. Backman also accused league medical director Rob DeSantis of having a conflict of interest because DeSantis was also employed as the head trainer of the Bradenton Juice. The guy doing the drug test who was the uh, trainer for the Bradenton team, uh, you know, gave some slack to other teams, his team in particular. I heard that Bradenton's team, which Rob DeSantis is the trainer, uh, got a piece of paper out, put it out there and asked the players to sign their name to the list if they would not test positive to, to the drug test. And uh, in following up on that, found out that it was exactly true. Backman and his players also insisted that the drug tests were not given in accordance with league policies. The tests weren't done the right way. Somebody's supposed to be watching you at every single moment that you have that container and that you are filling the container, not like staring at you like that, because not many people will be able to go, right? But <laughs> we were left by ourselves with the vial for, it could have been like 15 minutes. She was outside smoking a cigarette and just left all the other drug tests just sitting in there. So for one, that's, that's not a, a legal drug test. It was done incorrectly from my standpoint. Uh -huh. uh, uh, identification, I think, is big. Uh, when affiliate ball, when I was with the Rangers, uh, it was always a, uh, ID card. I know for sure I didn't sign be before or after. I just, here you go, this is, I'm Johnny Washington, see you later. And uh, if that's what Brooks and Hoop did, I know it wasn't correct, because mine wasn't correct. Backman also accused the league of violating its own written procedures on how to handle players who had tested positive for banned substances. They're not supposed to be suspended the first time offense. It was supposed to be a counseling program that they were supposed to go to. Second offense was a suspension and then the third offense, I think, was either ejection from the league or even a stiffer uh, suspension, you know, after that. It was a very, very complicated situation, one that I felt like we didn't do a very good job of, of um, uh, after the, the announcement, following through and explaining to people what had happened. None of the players, nor myself, have ever seen the drug test. Never. The player has to see the drug test, the results of the drug test. Nobody's seen it. The way I look at it, I, I don't think the league had its duck in, ducks in a row as far as the testing. I mean, I know that the, their heart was in the right place, but you got to make sure you're doing it. And I guess you could talk it up to a rookie league making a mistake. Manager Wally Backman has agreed to step down as the manager of the South Georgia Peanuts. There's only so far you can go with con consistent negative or adverse things happening with one particular club before you just say, hey, uh, enough is enough. Good evening, everybody. After three suspensions for a total of 14 games, countless confrontations with the umpires and the league office, manager Wally Backman has agreed to step down as the manager of the South Georgia Peanuts. The wheels were put into motion on Monday when Backman held a press conference to address the suspension of two of his players. To me, I thought it was some of actually his most reserved comments when critiquing how things had been running the league at that point. I actually thought he handled it reasonably well. I mean, I think 
uh, you know, issuing your own separate press release is going to push some buttons, but I never thought that it would get to that point. And afterwards, you know, as soon as he got finished, we called, I called Jamie because, I mean, you know, that's what journalists do. You, you, you get the other side, and Jamie was furious. There's only so far you can go with con consistent negative or adverse things happening with one particular club before you just say, hey, uh, enough is enough. Following Backman's press conference, league officials rushed to Albany to meet with Backman and his coaching staff. When it got to the point where we were having the meeting after the game where they were going to determine that they were going to, you know, fire Wally, he had the papers laid out in front of Jamie and Chris. I had the drug policy right in front of me, and I was not backing down. And they admitted right in front of us that that's the first time they had seen the rules and regulations for the drug test policy. And they said, well, if you would have presented that to us in the way that you presented it to us now, then we could have got away where this would all have been done. When you have a rebuttal or you don't believe in, in the way things are happening, there's an appropriate way and appropriate platform to go about uh, you know, expressing that versus rushing over to the media or blasting the league or, uh, or you know, doing things in, in a very much unprofessional manager to get you, uh, unprofessional manager to get your point out there. I've said uh, time and time again, it's just more philosophical differences, and I've, I've respected the way we've handled the situation. It's been a, it's been a good uh, conversation. I got respect for Wally. I think what he does on the field is secondary to, to no one, and I'm, I'm quite positive he'll be back in, in the game pretty soon. On the next Playing for Peanuts. We hung Wally's jersey up in the dugout, and we knew that would kind of piss Jamie Tool off. He just told me, one out of three may be good on the baseball field, but it's not good with drug tests. I'm going to hire him back as the bench coach, whether it pissed the league off or not. Wally Backman is back. The former South Georgia Peanuts manager has returned just three days after parting ways with the Peanuts and the South Coast League. The next prank I'll be demonstrating is the hot seat. Visit playingforpeanuts.com to watch deleted scenes and to order the DVD of this show. I'm it.